go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the November edition of the Ag Sector Council seminar series entitled The Informal Seed Sector, a Behind-the-Seeds Look. The Ag Sector Council seminar series is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, lovingly known as KDAD. Uh, and so you'll see our KDAD team in the back of the room here today running the webinar, as we have a, a bunch of people joining us by webinar as well. So my name is Julie McCarty. I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USA Bureau for Food Security, and I'll just be facilitating and um, keeping everything on track today. So we have a great lineup, as you can see, um, of speakers here to discuss the informal state sector. And we actually, we have a, a technologically exciting event today in that we're bringing in two of our speakers remotely um, from around the world, from Bangladesh and from Africa. And so we thought we'd just quickly call on them um, to make sure that they can hear us and that we can hear them. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Victor, can you just say hello, Victor Afari Sefa? Yeah, hello. My name is Victor Afarsifa. I'm calling from Tanzania. All right. Sounds good. Victor, glad to hear you. And uh, Mehdi and Tashfiq, can you say hello from Bangladesh? Hello from Bangladesh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So right before we get started, I would just like to do my usual housekeeping issues. Uh, first, we always remind people to please silence your cell phones if you brought them with you, just so that we don't interrupt the speakers. And then uh, we like to generally hold Q&A until after the presentation so that we can pass around the microphone, make sure that the webinar participants can hear all of you. Um, although if you have a, a really burning question, you know, feel free to re raise your hand um, between presentations, but we generally like to let the speakers complete their presentations before Q&A. And then I would also just like to let you all know that our agrolink.org platform is on the verge of a really exciting facelift. We are upgrading Agrolinks very soon. And uh, so if you're a regular user of Agrolinks, you'll be seeing uh, some new features. We think it's going to be a lot easier to use, a lot easier to submit and share content. We'll have a new discussion section, ways to ask the experts various questions, uh, to get, engage more fully with Feed the Future's technical team, um, and uh, to continue joining events like this that are sponsored by AgriLink. So keep an eye out for um, that upgrade coming very shortly. All right, so we don't want to hold off too long in diving into the content. So I'm going to introduce our introducer, Mark Heisinger, uh, who will give a very brief preview and introduce our speakers. He is Senior Program Manager with the USAID Bureau for Food Security's Markets, Partnerships, and Innovation Office, and is the AOR for the Scaling Seeds and Technology Partnership that we have with Agra. So Mark, I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you, Julie. Well, it, this is, I hope, normal seed systems. It's not something that we have a lot of information on. I, I think the, the number of people looking at this issue is uh, a small number. Um, we are interested in, in scientists from Pennsylvania State University, uh, currently uh, a visiting uh, scholar with the David Rockefeller Center in, uh, in Latin America studies at Harvard University. Um, he has his PhD from Berkeley, California. Also, as you uh, heard their disembodied voices, uh, we have uh, speakers, uh, one of them is uh, with ADRDC based in uh, Tanzania, uh, working on vegetable seed issues and informal sector uh, approaches there, as well as the Catalyst Project uh, through uh, the Swiss Contact Swiss Foundation for Technical Cooperation in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm very excited to hear what the, the Swiss uh, Contact Swiss Foundation has to say, because we're starting to work with them more closely now in Mozambique. So. Uh, it's a, it'll be exciting to hear what else they're doing in, in the world. So without further ado, Carl. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Nice introduction. Um, thanks for this, this opportunity. 
Uh, here's my talk. Here's me. Um, this is what I would like to talk about. I'll describe a few points associated with what I'm referring to as cyber science, not the CY, but rather a different cyber science applied to informal seed systems and the informal seed sector is where I'll concentrate my attention with a few takeaways. So what am I referring to by cyber science, and this is really, in a way, the kind of gist of the talk. These are, these are perspectives that I myself, my research group, and also a significant number of other groups and institutions are really uh, building into sciences of human, inter, human environment interactions and applying those to, uh, to the informal seed sector and informal seed systems, so a focus on smallholders, small-scale farmers. Um, I'll refer to this point uh, at least a couple times, 2 to 2.5 billion uh, small-scale farmers, demographically still a really big part of the global landscape. Um, how can we think about informal seed systems in the context of intensification and sustainable intensification, uh, obviously a major global challenge and issue. Uh, AID has, uh, I think, some really interesting and important uh, initiatives in, in this direction. I will definitely uh, give my talk as promised, but I really look forward to interacting and talking with you all about any and all of these, these points. Um, a uh, biodiversity perspective is pretty central here. Informal seed sectors are associated with the significant use of, of biodiversity, especially, especially what people refer to as agrobiodiversity, so the biodiversity of cultivated um, biota, uh, crops and livestock and associated wild relatives. Um, and the idea of enhancing resilience is really central here, too. So how to build the capacity to respond to shocks in these systems. So these shocks could be environmental shocks associated with drought or, or other sorts of stressors, as well as socioeconomic ones, market failure, et cetera. So how can we think about the above points in the context of strengthening resilience in these kinds of systems? And I'll talk about science. I am a scientist. But I have a really broad definition of what that means. It's just evidence-based knowledge systems, so for me, in this context. So I'm really interested, actually, in kind of the knowledge management challenges and issues and opportunities that I see as really important to the informal seed sector. Uh, so uh, smallholders in the informal seed se uh, sector, we're basically looking at kind of the the multiple nodes or uses of uh, local seed or the informal seed sector, not necessarily local. Some of these informal seed sectors are scaled at national and, and even international levels. We're looking at interactions, too, between informal and formal seed sector. There is not like a, there's not a firewall between these kinds of systems, so it's actually really interesting to think about varieties that do move between these, and I could go into that, but, but just to, to put it out there as an idea. The, uh, in the upper right, what we're looking at is a study of 11 countries where we are actually, that Mark's point was really uh, well taken. You know, there's not much information out there. We are starting to come up with some really interesting country-level studies. This is a mass of data, 11 countries, looking at an index of informal seed systems as a function of seed size. And the, the takeaway on this is just the, the concentration of higher level, higher reliance on informal seed in the smaller scale farms. So this really is a smallholder issue. And, and we can draw different regression lines for different world regions and different crops and minor crops, major crops, et cetera. But all of those lines show a lot of concentration of 
informal feed sec sector reliance among smallholder populations. So that's just a really strong link or linkage in these systems that's a big part of, of what we're doing and what we're, what we're working on. The intensification piece, the, the I in the, in the, in the cyber that uh, I'm referring to is, is really important. Conventional wisdom is that as agriculture intensifies, you have a drop off of biodiversity. We're actually, that, that is a general rule of thumb and, and, and yet there really are different pathways. I think that's the bottom line and we're, you know, in a sense that uh, the goal is to stay on one of these upper curves where you can incorporate more biodiversity into intensification. Uh, and on the right side of this slide is just an example of where in an extended case study uh, the axes are different. Don't try to wrap your mind around that graph in the upper right. It's, but the, the, the bottom line is that there's a lot of biodiversity incorporated into an intensification sin, sin, uh, trajectory in a, in a Polyvian case study that we did between 2000 and 2010, high levels of biodiversity, and it totally depended on the informal seed sector supplying seed that farmers were able to to put into kind of new fields, smaller fields, differently sequenced fields, fields with different, different growing seasons, all those, all those kind of new opportunities, innovations that were going on in order to kind of change things as part of intensification depended on seed inputs from the informal seed sector. So for me, I'm not saying that this is like an ironclad rule, but there are opportunities here to connect the informal seed sector to, uh, you know, kind of type two trajectories, try to stay on the upper part of that curve, keep agrobiodiversity in these systems while intensification occurs. That depends on informal seed. So, so, so when, when my, in my research and my group, we're really trying to connect the intensification issue and the informal seed uh, issue. Uh, biodiversity in these systems uh, can be very high. Often it's more on the moderate level. But basically, the way I like to think of it, if you go back to, the, to the, the diagram of the informal seed sector, there are a lot of nodes. There are a lot of, of different places where farmers are using or obtaining seed. Each of those nodes represents an opportunity for different variation to kind of pop up in the system. So these do tend to be higher diversity seed systems. There, there, there's nothing kind of inherent about that. There's no, no intrinsic property. But if you think about an, in, it's all about networks in a way. If you think about an informal seed system as having many nodes in the network, each of those nodes represents an opportunity for variation to kind of build up in the system. So these do tend to be higher agrobiodiversity systems. And again, tons of details there. But um, uh, here we're back up to the ER, uh, the enhancing resilience piece of these systems. And, and really, I think the importance of informal seed here is that it provides farmers the capacity to respond in low, medium, high intensity systems. This is the way kind of resilience thinking works, we're aiming to have either resilient or even like hyper-resilient so-called opportunistic responses, avoid collapses. But, but seeds provide, the informal seed sector really does provide a capacity to respond to shocks. Where that's happening globally right now is, is often in terms of uh, diversity of seeds providing different maturation periods or growing seasons. So if there are droughts, if uh, as in Mexico, Central and South America, East Africa where I'm working, crops are moving typically upslope uh, in response to climate changes, that depends on informal seed systems providing different maturation periods in the seed lots that farmers can access. For me, that's a good example of resilience, right, in these systems. They're responding to shocks that are occurring and they're accessing seeds that uh, are short, short maturation, short cycle uh, kinds of seeds. So, so there are lots of different examples of that, but that's just one that I can toss out there. 
So, so we went through the, the, the cyber piece, smallholders, intensification, biodiversity, enhancing resilience. I probably have a few minutes left, and so I will um, go to some applications, talk about seed system structure and function, social participation and crowdsourcing approach that we're developing, and what I call markets and mixed approaches. I have no idea if I'll get to all of these, but however far I get, you know that this is kind of looming in the background. So feel free to, I welcome the chance to, to talk about this. In terms of uh, seed system structure and function in informal seeds, uh, like I was saying, it, it is about the networks. And these are networks that exist that these are individual communities, and what this map shows is a lot of seed that's being exchanged within communities, but also between communities. So when we think about the structure, one of the things we think about is the spatial structure. And this is really important, because it's often the, the flow of seeds from outside of communities that replenishes in the case of drought or some other kind of shock. So resilience requires these these multiple levels. And the way seeds move in these systems, it's important for resilience, but it's very basic to like the environmental properties of the systems. So if we think about adaptive capacity environmentally, I don't want to go into a big ecology uh, tangent, but basically adaptive capacity in seeds depends on where they're grown. They kind of co-evolve with those environments. And where they're grown depends on these where they move through the networks. So in a sense, those networks are driving the type of adaptive capacity in these seeds. So we need to see the seed networks as very related to the adaptive capacity of different varieties and different species. And this is just an ecological test of that that's um, part, of, part of what I work on. And, several other groups and, and, uh, and institutions. So what's the strategy? What's the take home that, that we can get out of this? I think the take home here is the importance of identifying and connecting the networks across scale. So it's not just about networks. It's about networks of networks. So it's about how the networks connect. And, and informal seed sector knowledge right now has a huge opportunity because most of, most of what we've worked on is community and village level systems. And that's extremely important. There's lots of sort of nice, low-hanging fruit kinds of opportunities. But what we really need to do in terms of knowledge systems and on the ground programs and projects is connect those village and community systems to the landscape and region scale uh, seed systems, which is it's, it's at those higher levels where the seed's kind of coming from, it moves, in a sense, it moves both up and down the ladder. So, so when, when this village has a, uh, a, a drought event, for example, they replenish as a result of informal networks from the landscape. If there's a landscape scale uh, event, a market failure or, or drought or whatever, it could replenish through the region level. So, so we really need to think about how can we connect the, the networks. And, and we have a, um, an idea, really, for a project that we call the Bridging the Gaps Project. Um, this would be to work with community groups, to work with NGOs and, and government agencies. Uh, a lot of this is work with, that I do with CG centers. In this case, it's, it's with SIP and with SEAT, um, SEAT in, in Colombia, but also in Vietnam. And um, we really want to. Uh, to, to see that we can, can kind of build capacity in connecting across these gaps, which I think is a, is a, is a really nice opportunity right now. Um, in my lab, we do a lot of geographic information systems, remote sensing. Some of that technological capacity turns out to be really well suited, but also just a lot of on the ground partnerships with um, all kinds of, of groups and, and uh, institutions are really uh, integral to, to these projects, too. OK, second application is to this idea of social participation and crowdsourcing. 
This is another CG collaboration that I have um, uh, with uh, Bioversity International. And uh, the idea is to share information, build social inclusivity through uh, social participation and crowdsourcing approaches. I'll give the example of the India part of this project. We also have plans for Ethiopia and for Central America. In the India part of this project, uh, it's work on wheat and rice. In the case of the crowdsourcing, it's really information sharing at this point. There are 15,000 farmers who are sharing information about wheat varieties. And I could go into like vast details about this, but I think what I want to emphasize is that we're that it's it's an amazingly effective way of kind of upscaling information. It, it, in a way, it goes right back to Mark's point too about kind of an information poor setting. How do we generate information in these contexts? And and crowdsourcing is really interesting in this regard. Technologically, it's really interesting. We certainly have kind of an interest in online and in cell phone uh, accessible kinds of technologies for, for this um, information. Um, and for me, the strategy point, the takeaway that I'd like to emphasize is part of this that my group's working on a lot, which is one of the really interesting parts about crowdsourcing, which is very much kind of like a bottom ground up um, process, very local, but it generates masses and masses and masses of information that are no longer local. So this is a really interesting like information management issue. So lots of different parts of that information management, but the strategy that we're working on is visualization tools. So this is a lot of work that we, we do in my geosynthesis lab uh, and, and other groups is how can we how can we share this information in visual forms? So these are actually variety specific maps. So we're looking at um, 20 different varieties and their performance spatially and geographically across these areas in India, either in, 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 in at higher level of, be, of, of ranking or lower level. Basically, farmers rank varieties relatively as top, middle, bottom. Each farmer works with three varieties. And then we amass and process that information. This is just really simple kind of visualization and statistics. There are actually some really interesting statistical approaches that can drive the mapping. So that's actually another thing we're working on, is how do you visualize kind of the statistically generated information, but then put that back in the hands of farmers. So citizen science is so, I mean, this citizen science and, and crowdsourcing is so interesting that it starts with simple information, it becomes complex information, and then you want to sort of be able to make it accessible again. So, so I think it's really interesting opportunity. Um, markets and mixed approaches, um, uh, these informal seed systems have a huge market component. It's often mixed with non-market. Uh, sort of uses, so the uh, familiar dividing of harvest between sale and marketing and seed and consumption, and here's some statistics of, based on extensive surveys and what it means in terms of varieties on the land. But the bottom line for me on something like this is that these, these informal seed systems are, are extremely mixed. There's, we tend to dichotomize Oh, is it for the market or not for the market? There is so much fluidity, and, and I think that there, there are interesting opportunities there, too. So, so um, strategy-wise, for the example I'll give is, is just uh, the, this is an example of maize. I tend to work with staple crops. You've seen the potatoes. I work with maize. I work with wheat. I've worked with rice. Um, this is just looking at, at, at market sales, but also local seed exchange. And using remote sensing and geographic information systems, we're looking at a smallholder landscape where the fields cluster. So farmers, uh, to coordinate water use and other reasons, they, they will grow, tend to grow maize fields next to each other, and then they share seed. And so 
that's a kind of what we call a spatial externality, but a positive spatial externality. And how can we kind of use that to potentially generate a ripple or a cascading effect where maybe a small investment could produce a, a large positive change across a landscape? So that's, that's the idea of that. Perfect timing. I think I am on takeaways. Oops. Just go to takeaways. I think these are a few of the main takeaways that I want to end with is that idea of identifying and connecting networks across scales. I really feel like the, the knowledge in informal seed sectors, projects, and activities have evolved to where we really need to move up from community and village-based systems and think about landscape and regional levels and seed, move, seed moving up and down the, those ladders. How can we get that knowledge? How do we manage that knowledge? It won't be the same as the village and community-based kinds of partnerships that are extremely local, et cetera. There's a, there's a role for expert knowledge kind of combined with that extremely sort of locally-based knowledge. Um, I emphasized the uh, crowdsourcing and participatory approaches and that opportunities there, which I think are really interesting for generating knowledge and, vis and the importance of visualizing it. And just in general, um, I don't know, you know the extent to which uh, you know, we have a familiar idea of thinking about seeds and breeding as the G, G cross E model of genotype and environment. Well, when I think of seeds, I think of seeds interacting with the environment and then with the social and economic context of farmers and farming communities. So, so I think kind of having that three-piece um, framework uh, it underlies everything I said. All those elements of seed system, environment, and farmer, socioeconomic, and cultural, those are all kind of behind the scenes. I think that was in the title here. Those were all like behind the scenes here. I really need to be sure to acknowledge a lot of collaborators in these projects. All my work is collaborative. I have and I do uh, appreciate uh, opportunities of collaborating with uh, USAID. I also uh, have worked with the National Science Foundation. I have a lab called the Geosynthesis Lab um, and lots of peasant, indigenous, smallholder communities and collaborators, uh, several of the CG systems, uh, international, national universities, and, uh, and, and these citizen science and crowdsourcing groups have become an important part of this collaboration mix for me as well. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm sure there will be some questions for you in, during our Q&A period at the end. Um, but for now, we are going to shift over to Victor from AVRDC, the World Vegetable Center. So let's make sure that we can hear you, Victor. Yeah, I'm online. Yes. All right, so we'll bring up your volume in here. A Hello. Bit, but you sound good to me. So please go ahead. OK. So I will uh, essentially be focusing more on the vegetable uh, seed systems, uh, specifically on informatic systems, and I'll um, zoom in mostly uh, given my experiences from what that has been done in Tanzania and some other parts of Eastern and Southern Africa. So uh, as uh, you can see, uh, my name is Victor Farsefa, and I work as a social economist uh, um, with AVRC in Tanzania. I'll just give a brief overview of what informal seed systems uh, are. Uh, I think uh, Carl already did uh, give a, a comprehensive overview of that. But ideally, this is uh, anything that can be from reading from an individual or a kind of group system. So for individuals, you can have the uh, smallholder farmers exchanging um, seeds or through butter or it can be through a gift or sometimes even through labor exchange or even for certain social obligations where seed becomes a form of exchange. It could also be through a, a, a means by which a group of uh, farmers, and this can either be a formal group or an informal group, uh, coming together to produce seeds that are specifically adapted to their um, agroecological systems and of particular preferences um, 
for consumption. Now, this is by far the most important source of seed uh, for most farmers uh, within uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in general. Now, we also have the recognized community seed production systems, uh, and these uh, normally could be either project-based, uh, based on interventions uh, where funding is coming from different donors, uh, and also through informal relationships between traders and farmers, where sometimes traders will pre-finance uh, production of seeds uh, for the option of getting the first buy um, at harvest um, at harvest period. Now, in most parts of most uh, sub-Saharan Africa, this um, type of uh, informal seed system, which we will normally call farmer-led seed enterprises, account for between 75 to 80 percent of um, the total seeds um, that are used for production. So you see that is quite very, very significant. The former sector, which is the private seed companies, uh, account for quite a very small proportion of this, and I think this is well documented already. Now, now the question is why farmer-led seed enterprises? Um, and the reason is not far-fetched. Um, as you recall, I recall particularly in most parts of sub-Saharan Africa, in the 70s and 80s, um, there was a lot of state-owned enterprises, and uh, most of the seed production and supply systems were managed by um, the public sector um, through a lot of uh, structural adjustment programs. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a, a led to the privatization of most of these, um, most likely in, uh, probably also in the 90s. Of course, around that same time, too, there were a lot of uh, emergency seed aid. Um, but as you realize, uh, the, the fact that the privatization was necessary to make the process much more efficient. Now, unlike the public sector, most of the private sector um, try to emphasize more on profit maximization, which is really quite clear, and they focus on high-value cash crops, and of course, try to concentrate on, uh, on low volume, um, just to segment the market uh, to ensure that you get the right um, demand. Due to the exclusivity or the need to have intellectual property rights and make sure that the business is uh, not um, patronized by other competitors, they try to focus more on hybrid seeds. But of course, this varies from one um, region to the other. And the, the main challenge, even as of now, is that um, the, there's a lot of seed adulteration. Now, uh, even for the private seed companies, we have people taking their logos and also printing seeds, uh, putting in seeds that are not even certified and also trying to sell. You know, so this is a major challenge even with the current private sector. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the requirement of small farmers or smallholders? We normally we want flexibility and, of course, the diversity in terms of the variety and then the requirements of uh, or what the expectation is to get from such seeds. <coughs> so with the diverse agroecology, and the need for more specific seeds that uh, meet their preferences. Um, there's a need for them to look beyond both the private sector and even um, some of the countries which still have a vibrant public sector. <coughs> now, the typical characteristics of these uh, farmer-led seed enterprises are that, of course, uh, you want to conserve genetic resources. The farmers try to do that, and of course, there have been a lot of discussion on the farmer rights. Um, in this particular case, farmers get involved in um, uh, participatory crop improvement, and um, you realize that um, they get involved and try to contribute rather than having it more as a kind of top-down approach. And then, of course, um, in most cases, um, some private sectors even contract um, some of these farmers and farmer groups to produce seed for them. But of course, this is much more on from the farmer-led side than from the seed companies. And of course, the seeds that are produced are of local supply and meet the um, specific um, demands of the agroclimate and also the taste and preferences of the farm. So the key characteristics, um, yeah, of course, you realize that um, the trees at the local level and the most of them are a wide range of exchange. I think that Carl also mentioned about that, that people try to exchange seeds of various forms. And then, of course, the critical thing here is it directly addresses the um, immediate needs of the farmer in terms of the timing of planting, which is for the season. Um, the special, uh, this is most of the private seed companies are unable to reach um, certain communities um, from their main operating um, cities where they produce the seeds. 
And then, of course, um, things like information gaps and, and, and the value of, of the seeds uh, are best uh, uh, interpreted by the farmers in this consequence. Now, certification is a key issue because the fact is that um, in most of these, uh, seeds are not actually certified and certification is just based on mutual trust or what we call social certification. So now, critically, we we'll realize that most of these are technically equipped. We have a market driven because in most cases it's demand driven. And then, of course, um, the seed business is quite autonomous. Uh, the farmers may have their own uh, rights to um, <coughs> go about their issues. And of course, it is much more decentralized. So I will now want to focus on one particular type of seed system here in Tanzania uh, called the quality decreed seed. And I think probably most of you are aware of this. This was introduced by the SO in 2004, and uh, typical examples where this kind of practice in Tanzania and Madagascar. And this is a kind of seed that are produced within a specific agroecological zone, such that you don't have testing done in all um, the agroecological zones of the country, but probably one particular area, maybe the semi-arid region. And then seeds that are produced are supposed to be also certified um, with a certification body. But it just happens that also with that restriction, you are ideally supposed to sell the seeds within that agroecological zone. So that's kind of a kind of a limitation. And uh, the other thing is that since it is um, based on the farmer lead, in most cases they have to use manual seed extraction procedures, and this can be quite laborious. Now the challenge here is that uh, you realize that I try to compare where the quality declared seed with a seed contract system that was uh, based on an Irish aid and um, a Sarita funded project in Tanzania. And this is a collaboration, again, uh, within researchers, extensionists, and private sector, uh, where we try to compare a private seed uh, a contract model with a quality declared seed. Now, I realize that we did selection, the process um, sampling, we did a baseline study, we built the capacity of the farmers to be able to produce the seeds. And then, of course, we organized um, training of trainers workshops. Uh, we took monitoring visits, and then we tried to compare the two farm uh, seed enterprises based on representative farm and also later on with detailed household surveys. Now, the interesting thing is that we found that farmers gain more, um, get more money from producing seed than producing vegetables themselves. You know? Actually, the benefit cost ratio <coughs> was about 2.27 for the contract seed model, but interestingly very high for the quality declared seed simply because they use much more low input systems compared to the private um, seed company model. Now the revenues from the um, sale of seeds was also increased by 2.3% uh, times if farmers are able to access um, certified seeds. Now difficulties encountered by some farmers in assessing viable markets, as I said, trying to access markets Beyond that, agroecological zone can sometimes be difficult, and the fact that the seed is not much differentiated than ordinary standard seed sold in the market. So branding was critical to uh, ensure success. Now, the other thing is that we also require public private partnerships to be able to ensure um, the success of these, um, particularly if you want to look into the private sector model. Then, of course, um, because of the regulatory um, requirements, and a niggling environment is required for that, particularly if they are to be sustainable. And then, of course, the issue of capacity building and then, as I said, collaborative network between the extension system and other research systems is quite critical for, for this. Now, I'll just highlight a little bit on another seed model, uh, which is integrated seed uh, sector development uh, funded by the Dutch government and then the Madagascar Gates Foundation. Uh, we realized that um, in this particular instance, we try to link the formal e-commerce system um, quite more uh, accurately. And uh, <clears throat> this um, is quite um, interesting to bridge that gap between the formal and the informal uh, seed sector. <clears throat> now, there's also the Village Voice Seed Enterprise. And this is not directly a donor-funded project, but uh, basically a kind of um, facilitation by ICADA, where people come together in a village and try to produce seeds. And then, based on that, we come together and I think ICADA just tries to do a kind of facilitation for um, ensure that the seeds uh, can be produced and farmers can make significant um, profits. Now, 
already there are a lot of um, big voices that are trying to break this system between the formal and informal sector. Um, we have uh, Africa Seed Program, Agra is doing quite a lot. We have the West African Seed Alliance and several others. And uh, in, by way of conclusion, I just highlight a few things. Um, realize that uh, most of these um, informal or cheap sector, um, particularly the community ones, are donor-funded, um, and of course, it encourages dependency. Uh, the way to go about this is try to institutionalize this by encouraging um, private sector investment where possible. And then, of course, we need to consider all the technical issues uh, related to uh, most of these um, seed systems uh, to make them also quite sustainable. And then, of course, there's a need to link these informal seed systems to the formal seed sector to get foundation seed, the research aspect, the capacity building component is quite critical. Now, there's also no one-size-fits-all for farmer-led seed enterprises or the informal seed sector. And, of course, it depends on the specific circumstances that will depict what really has to do and what will work. And, of course, critical is that it's demand-driven. So um, that is um, certainly um, where I will want to end my talk. And uh, thanks very much um, for your attention. And I look forward to um, answering questions later in the seminar. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Victor. Um, and thank you for staying within time as requested. And I'd just like to let our in-person participants know that these slides uh, will be available on agrolinks.org this afternoon. There's a lot of rich information in these slides. Um, and so if you go to agrolinks.org, you should be able to access them under events on the event page for this seminar. And we'll also be sending out a link to all of you uh, who attended today with the recording of this event, the slides, and any other associated resources. So you can review all of those after the fact. All right, so next up, our, our last presentation, uh, we have Mehdi and Teshvik from Swiss Contract, the Catalyst Project, uh, joining us from Bangladesh. So Hello. please go ahead. Yeah, we can Hello. hear you. Hello, everyone. I'm extremely delighted to be one of the presenters of this seminar today. Uh, I will present a story, a story that changed life to thousands of poor vegetable farmers in Bangladesh. Right. I will be uh, presenting and Tashvi Garsan. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Just a suggestion to speak somewhat slowly to make sure that we can, um, we can okay. hear it easily in the room here. I will be presenting and Tashvi Garsan will be more active in the question and session. Okay, this is our presentation agenda. First of all, we'll talk a, a little about our project and approach, and then we'll go to the intervention uh, area, and then finally we'll talk about the way forward and take rest from this presentation. Okay, um, at first I would like to introduce um, my project to you. Uh, Catalyst is a market development project that aims to contribute to increasing the income of poor men and women in rural areas. Uh, it does by facilitating changes in services, input, and product market, increasing the competitiveness of farmers and small enterprises. Um, our phase three is co-funded by uh, SGC, DFID, and Venida. During phase two, Catalyst has benefited 2.4 million farmers, and during phase three, it plans to benefit 1.4 million farmers and aims to increase the increase income of uh, 250 million US dollars. So these are the sectors we currently work. Uh, we have three core sectors, namely vegetable, farm fish, and maize. And uh, we have cross sectors, women, economic empowerment, and um, local education network and information channels. Now, uh, I would go through how this works. A farmer is poor. It's not a problem for us. Rather, this is a symptom. So we analyze why and how a farmer is poor, and then why does not the market system work to solve the problem. Eventually, what you get as answer is the underlying causes of why farmer is poor. This guides us to develop the intervention that changes the market system. As a result, poor gets uh, access to market inputs, services, etc., which in turn increases income and thereby reduce poverty. 
Uh, so here you can see the context of the vegetable seed market in Bangladesh. Um, large farmer have access to quality seed. Around 20 to 25 percent of the farmers uh, use quality seeds and they get higher yield. But on the other hand, uh, the poor farmers do not use quality seeds and they are not getting higher yield. So as you can see from here that 70% uh, of seeds are being supplied by the informal sectors uh, which are basically uh, which are basically locally produced uh, by the local farmers and others. So why this is happening? Uh, large farmers have access to quality seeds. They have big lands and money to buy quality seeds. But on the other hand, small and homestead farmers, they rarely use quality seeds uh, due to many reasons. Few reasons include that uh, genetic information and hence can't identify the quality seed. Uh, they are not aware about the benefit of using uh, quality seed. Even even if they are aware, they do not need the quantity available in the regular packets of quality seed. So they use substandard seed saved from the previous service or buying inferior quality seed. So that they do not get uh, higher yield. So from this, we found the intervention area, which is basically uh, availability of quality vegetable seeds uh, catering to the needs of poor, small, and homestead farmers. Uh, before going to our main intervention, uh, I would like to go back to another intervention, which was done previously by Catalyst. In 2008, Catalyst started working with a seed company by including mobile seed vendors, MSBs, uh, in the company's distribution channel. Mobile seed vendors are uh, basically a few seed sellers who visit different uh, markets and sell seeds. Up to that point, MSBs uh, had been selling only inferior quality non-packet seeds to poor farmers. Within two years, this initial intervention had been widely adopted by other companies and showed there was a high market demand for quality vegetable seeds among poor farmers. It was also observed from this intervention that small farmers were buying seeds sold by the MSBs from open packets. Basically, what MSBs were actually doing, they were cutting the large packets and uh, selling in small quantity as the need of the poor farmers were for small quantity seeds. This market scenario reinforced the idea of uh, smaller packets of seeds. Uh, so, so, in March 2011, uh, Catalyst partnered with two leading private seed companies uh, to introduce mini packets of quality vegetable seeds catering to the needs of smallholder farmers. The idea was very simple. They could sell more seeds, probably to an untapped section of the farmers, if they had appropriately sized and priced products. Uh, and it will also reduce the opportunities for adulteration by distributors, retailers, and vendors. Mm. And it was basically identified as the major uh, interest of the seed company. Uh, so mini packs for 35 varieties, uh, which would cover around 0.03 acres to 0.04 acres were introduced in the market. Mm, and also, the price of the mini packets were 12 cents for OP varieties and to 25 cents for hybrid varieties, whereas the regular packets were priced at 1 to 2 uh, US dollars. So basically, this is our uh, result chain of how intervention has evolved. Uh, initially, we facilitated two seed companies to assess market, develop strategic plan, and packaging for promoting vegetable seeds in mini packs. Then the company started promoting and distributing quality vegetable seeds to farmers through networks of knowledgeable mobile seed vendors. Then uh, it happened that channel members were making quality seed available to the farmers through mini packets. And the smallholder farmers had access, increased access and usage of quality seeds in the farm. Uh, hello? Uh, so initially the intervention was initially piloted in three districts. One company expanded it in 55 districts within a year. Uh, how did that happen? Well, in first season, targets were to sell 100,000 mini packets, but uh, they overshot and sold 50, uh, 558,000 mini packets. In the following year, Lal Peer, one of our partners, alone sold 1.3 million mini packs. So though the idea seems very simple, but why it wasn't that easy to implement? Because uh, companies focus on large farmers as ROI is uh, higher, and also 
it was not a guaranteed business case for them. So companies were reluctant to invest. In Bangladesh, most companies perceived first mover advantage as short lived. So they were not that interested to invest in this mini packet idea. And but when you showed them the mini pack, uh, when you showed them the market scenario with what happened in the uh, mobile seat vendor interventions, and they were on board to implement. So when engaging a private sector partner, what you look for is like first of all uh, their incentives, which include profit. They will uh, their increase in market share, and also they will have a good reputation in the business as they are catering to small farmers. Uh, another point is very important, which is scalability. And uh, we ask the questions: Are the companies capable uh, capable enough to do it on their own? When we will no longer be uh, when we will no longer be able to support. And also, we'll, uh, we ask the questions: Are the financials strong enough? Another key element is the quality of inputs or services they provide, because we see their market reputation, product quality, and then we engage them as a partner. So here is the impact. I will talk about uh, in a brief uh, The number of cumulative beneficiary households from mini packet user grew from 236,000 uh, to 339,000, and subsequently to 458,000. In subsequent seasons, uh, 2012, and in repeat buying rose from 15 to 41 percent and till December 2013 as you can see our total number of beneficiaries was, was uh, 570,900,000 uh, and an average beneficiary used the seed on an average of 0 0.03 to 0 0.05 acres of land mm -hmm. and around 80 percent of the beneficiaries lived below the $205 a day poverty, $2.5 a day poverty line. Um, at least 90% of the beneficiaries also used the produce grown from mini packets to feed their families. 40% of farmers used the mini packets in home gardens and there were over 100,000 female beneficiaries. Uh, the, mini packet, um, the mini packets have also been successful in having demonstration effect on peer farmers, be it small, medium, marginal, homestead or even large farmers. Mini packets also enable medium or or large farmers to experiment with new crops, farmers are also adopted to use better quality seeds. And we found that homestead farmers are having access to quality seeds because of the appropriate size product. And most of the home homestead farmers were women, so it has a strong gender inclusion. Uh, it was also observed that optimal utility from the packets has sometimes been hindered due to you know uh, limited knowledge of poor farmers and home gardeners and uh, proper cultivation techniques for HYB or hybrid seeds. A rather interesting learning was uh, a stronger distribution channel with the appropriate product has a strong impact on access rather than extensive demonstration and access. The company's own analysis showed that um, growth of its mini pack sale also contributed to the growth of their normal packs, which has grown by 35% since the introduction of mini packets. And our impact on income was uh, we had income increase for 25 million USD and each farmer found uh, we found that each farmers were benefiting income for uh, thirty uh, four dollars per year. So what we are doing now after the, from this intervention, we are doing few other things. Uh, uh, we are partnering with other companies uh, to scale up in remote uh, more remote areas and uh, so that the quality seats are available in remote areas and. We are also providing cultivation related information through seed packaging so that the farmers became aware of uh, became aware of the cultivation knowledge and uh, make it a proper vegetable cultivation. And key takeaways from this presentation will be the idea was very simple. So as you can see, a very simple business idea can have big impact on poor lives. And we should not focus on complex things only. Rather, the simple ideas can uh, change the lives of thousands of poor farmers. Also, the timing of the intervention is very critical. Sometimes to implement an intervention, it is necessary to take pre-intervention measures. Mm. Another very important takeaway is uh, quality product does its own promotion and if the private sector companies have quality products, they can effectively reach poor farmers for a sustainable uh, 
develop an initiative. So this was all from our side. Uh, thank you, everyone. And to know more about our project, please visit our website, as it is mentioned, um, at catalyst.com.bd. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Thank you. Um, did the project pay for the, the new packaging and how did you identify the seed company and who paid for the new packaging? Was that the project that paid or the uh, private company? Um, Mehdi, over to you. Sorry, we didn't hear that. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, Mahedi, uh, yes, I was asked, wondering, <clears throat> did the project pay the uh, seed suppliers for the new packaging, or did the seed suppliers use their own investments for the new packaging? And if, regardless of who paid, after the next uh, planting season, is it sustainable? Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Uh, so to answer the first question, we at Catalyst work on a cost sharing basis. So initially, uh, we share the cost of not the product, but let's say rather the launching of the product and uh, basically identify all the study that went on beforehand to identify which seed varieties would be working more. For example, uh, as you can tell from this entire discussion, the open pollinated varieties are more, let's say, available at local level. So these formal companies also compete with the informal sector in that segment. So selecting that was where we added value. Uh, also in terms of uh, promoting the mini packet idea in terms of farmer training uh, demonstration is where we shared costs. But in terms of the actual packaging, uh, no costs were shared. Uh, was the answer to the first segment. Uh, the second segment was, was it sustainable, if I'm correct? Uh, well, as, is, uh, as we shared already, we started the intervention in 2011, and we kind of stopped uh, our cost sharing or our activities with them in two thousand by 2012. And it's already 2015, and we see uh, it has already reached around 600,000 beneficiaries on their own. So they are continuing to do that. So in many ways, it is sustaining activity. I hope I have answered your query properly. Uh, so let's take a question. Yes, um, we actually have... Uh, a question was posed on the event page of the AgriLinks website uh, prior to the event. Babakar asks, um, what are locally envisioned solutions to short cycle hybrids and locally adapted varieties? Let's see. Is that a question you can chime in on, Carl? Well, <coughs> I uh, wonder uh, solutions to uh, to what exactly in that case? Maybe maybe the uh, the availability uh, would be what or access. Uh, sorts of issues are what come to mind, um, and uh, uh, I mean the the I I think the 
the immediate response there is is kind of the the general topic of our seminar, right? That the the informal seed sector really has a, a wide range of capacities involved that really does uh, include hybrids and uh, short cycle varieties. So uh, it, it, the informal sector doesn't have kind of an exclusive hold to those uh, sorts of, of seed products, but it certainly does have the capacity to, to circulate and and make accessible and available those 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 kinds of planting materials. So so it's it's uh, it, it, it's a generally relevant point to to what we're interested in. I guess it illustrates kind of the scope of of what the informal seed sector uh, does cover in terms of of products like short cycle and and hybrid seeds. Hi, I'm Ariella Zeigerman. I'm a AAA fellow at NSF. I have two questions, one for Carl and one for the Catalyst group. So I'll start with Carl because he's in the room. Um, so in that graph you showed that said you can keep biodiversity high even in the face of intensification if you stay on the upper curve. Mm -hmm. I want to know what that looks like in reality, how that works out. Right. And my question for the Catalyst people um, is, from your 12-cent mini packs, how much of the yields go to food, how much to seed savings, and how much to the marketplace? So, uh, I mean, that is the $64,000 question of how to stay on that upper curve. How, how can intensification uh, trajectories occur while uh, biodiversity is being conserved and, and, and there's a really lot of interesting, important work looking at sort of different different angles of that. Um, one way of addressing it, and, and maybe the one that's most consistent with what I was talking about in the slide there, is that there's a very high level of case study or local specificity in those solutions uh, as to how intensification trajectories occur and biodiversity is, uh, conservation is, is compatible with those scenarios. So in the case that I was talking about, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good and important question. Um, farmers were able to basically uh, intensify increased levels of production in certain field systems while resizing, rescoping their high agrobiodiversity field systems, largely because in, in that context, they really value those those seeds and those high agrobiodiversity foodstuffs for local consumption and local marketing. So, so those rationales were kind of the behind the seeds uh, forces that 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 drove a lot of innovation. Right? I mean, they were working with smaller fields. They were working with fields with with different. Um, Different growing seasons, water management turns out to be really related to this. And the point that that I want to connect to is that all those innovations that they made, that they were open to, that they were creating, depended on an informal seed system circulating material that worked for them. Right? The the seeds were present. It's a pretty densely populated area. Uh, where in, in a very, in my view, in a pretty positive way, part of that smallholder um, landscape is that 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 people buy and sell seeds, and that and that created an informal system that kept pumping in shorter cycle material or material that worked for the latest greatest way of of making a favorite locally consumed item or whatever. So that's a, and, and that's also like, that's my view in the, in the sense of like a, definitely an ecology and food emphasis. That's kind of where I come from when I think about intensification is ecology and food security issues. Other people do it differently, but that's, that's like how I, um, those are, those are the, the kind of analyses that, that I emphasize. So. Great, and um, 
Uh, Catalyst, could you address the breakdown of the 12 cents of your seed packets and where, where the money is going to? Uh, we observed that 60% of the seeds there were commercial farmers and 40% were homestead farmers. So uh, from, uh, from the 60% of the commercial farmers, uh, we found that most of the producers were sold in the marketplace. And around that, uh, for the homestead farmers, 50% were sold in the marketplace and 50% were consumed by the homestead farmers and their members or the family members. Uh, but we didn't observe any seed savings as such from this intervention. But I guess they saved, but we, we couldn't, maybe we couldn't like, track that out. Um, I guess this answer your question. Thank you. All right, we'll take a, a question from online and then come back up here. Okay. So Colin Corey has a question I've been from online discussion about the role of seed laws and how that trickles down to uh, smallholder farmers. And um, he's interested in hearing about successful experiences where uh, informal seed systems can coexist and thrive, uh, where there are strong national seed laws, he has experiences then that um, overly restrictive laws can harm the informal system, but has heard that perhaps in other areas they can work together to be mutually supportive. Have you seen greater benefits or harm? Is that um, something that Victor you might like to chime in on, or in Carl, or, or anyone? Um, I didn't get that quite clear. Um, Victor, if you'd like to chime in, that was a question about um, seed laws and how info the informal seed sector can still operate well if seed laws might be a, a little bit too restrictive in some cases, successful examples. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, so it's still not quite clear to me here. No, I mean I I I. Oh, okay. So I I, I, I it's Well, if I can take that um, now, the seed laws. I mean, I think uh, it varies from location to location. But in principle, the seed laws are there. But I think the challenge is the implementation. You know, uh, most of these are supposed to be done by the top sector, but we all know that the challenge is that they are in most cases understaffed, and then uh, in some places too, they are too centralized, and they are not able to be able to reach um, some of these uh, communities that are in the hinterland, and therefore people uh, just um, go around do stuff and they are not checked. You know. So a lot of seed, for example, is so sold that are not certified in countries where they're supposed to be certified. So that is a challenge. Hi, I'm uh, Peter Boone. I guess I direct my question a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, to to uh, Carl and Victor, um, in terms of um, the informal seed. Uh, sectors. Um, I didn't hear a lot of um, the major challenges of the informal seed sector coming out of your discussions that I did hear in the Swiss contact one. Um, some of the challenges, you know, are pretty well known that there's um, just in general a lot of low quality, you don't hear a lot of quality seed coming out of an informal system. There's, al there's almost no potential that I know of for hybrids coming out of there. Uh, you know, when you're talking drought resistant. So there's the list of challenges is, at least in a lot of places I've been, is almost overwhelming. They're often saving the lowest quality seed uh, from, the, from the plant that survived uh, in the field but never produced a lot. And then when they do store it, uh, it's not under very good conditions. So when we talk about all this exciting, you know, interconnecting and scaling up and crowdsourcing and all this information, that's an investment. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, at the cost-benefit level, 
are we investing in a very weak and almost broken system uh, just because it's out there? Yeah. Yeah. To answer your question, I think uh, one of the main challenges uh, of, of the informal system is uh, trying to get them institutionalized. You know? uh, because, in, like I said, most of them uh, seem to be based on uh, bond funding. And then uh, once the, 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 the project comes to a close, the sustainability component is not well laid off, and then um, it becomes a challenge. But even in the course of implementing uh, some of the projects, uh, there are issues, uh, lots of them, but maybe I'll talk about three. One that we particularly found in the case of Tanzania was the issue of differentiation of the, of the, the produce, whatever seeds that are produced. Because you also have farmers just selling seeds that are not um, certified or have not gone through proper um, regulatory systems and are sold in the market. Now, we also had facilitated and uh, worked with farmers to produce um, seeds under the quality declared seed system, but they did not have any basis for any uh, options to brand it. You know, in Tanzania, for example, seeds are sold in empty match boxes, for example, and you cannot differentiate between what a farmer has just taken out from his or her harvest and then the one that we went through the certification process uh, to, to get certified and is of course supposed to be of a better quality. They were sold in the same container, so there was no branding. And that was a big challenge in trying to differentiate this product from what could also be uh, a seed that is not um, of good quality. One other thing that is faced is, of course, in terms of the implementation, is also the processing. You know, and they mostly have to use um, local materials uh, to do manual processing. And this can sometimes be a challenge, particularly when it's on a small scale. So sometimes they will need like a seed extractor, you know, to be able to improve the quality and stuff like that. Now again, you talk about a very important uh, critical issue in the case of vegetable seeds, and particularly for traditional African vegetables, one of the main challenges that uh, farmers encounter is uh, seed viability. Now, for these type of vegetables, normally once uh, seed is harvested and is processed and kept at room temperature, most of them will lose viability after six months. You know, if they are not kept under a uh, cold storage or a proper um, storage requirement. I mean, at our center, we do have cold storage and things to keep the atmosphere balance. But farmers just keep them in, in their house. So after six months, they lose viability, and some of them still keep trying to grow them or sell them in the next season when the seeds are actually not viable. You know. And uh, <clears throat> this actually requires we need to do a lot of uh, doing capacity building and telling them um, that some of these plants, I mean, talk about something like spider plants, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's so viable that after six months it moves viability. And under such a circumstance, it has to be kept under um, cold storage conditions. So maybe I'll just highlight on these three. But um, the main thing is that we need to try to get these um, informatic systems, try to institutionalize them, and by linking them to formal seed systems, but I think we have a lot of programs um, trying to get this done. And that probably is one way to um, strengthen these systems. Thanks. So uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that one, one way I tend to think about it is that um, the, the extent of these uh, smallholder informal sector uh, seed systems is uh, is so vast that there's actually a huge amount of variation within it. And for, for I mean, I'm a researcher, so for me it kind of opens the question, what about the variation of seed quality across or within that system? Because, I mean, the thing about seed quality is growers themselves are highly aware of seed quality differences. They're, you know, they're, they're not technical experts, but they're not, they care a lot about it. It has an immediate impact. So, so you know, in some sense, what we're looking at is kind of the trade-offs between accessibility of seed, meaning low cost, and quality of seed that tends to be associated with higher prices. And, and so there, there's a range there. And kind of looking, looking at that variation and looking at sort of viable kind of combinations in that range, I think, is a really interesting 
going back to Mark's point at the beginning, this is just, in some ways, this is a knowledge gap in, in terms of understanding these, these systems. That said, I mean, I think it's also interesting that there is at least some evidence that these informal sector seeds and varieties in particular can perform pretty well. So, for example, in the India case, um, it's roughly uh, those varieties that are being sort of performance tested. Um, this is not seed per se, but it gets to that question of sort of the traditional, typically underperforming um, components. The traditional varieties are uh, certainly performing uh, better than, a, than the, the lowest end of the improved varieties. And in fact, there are a couple of traditional varieties that are up in the, in the, in the upper part of the range. So, so that disease resistant and and so that is to say that that it, the informal seed system does have material in it that's relatively high performing last point is just I see this as potentially an opportunity seed quality is of interest to everyone if you if you um, think about crowd sharing crowdsourcing as a sharing of information not only about types of seed but about seed quality best practices etc those kinds of um, crowdsourcing and information sharing can can connect dots between type of variety and quality of seed. That's very kind of inherently linked compatible material. And so to undertake some of these approaches potentially brings in issues that are totally relevant um, but not necessarily uh, a part of existing discussion. We have time for a couple more questions, um, but in the meantime, if you need to take off early, we always ask you to fill out the survey uh, that was on your seat. It helps us improve the events for the future, and you can either leave it on the table or drop it off at the table as you're heading out, um, and also take as much food as you desire on your way out if you're here in person. Um, all right, so we'll take a couple more. I'll throw it back and just see if we have one more from our online audience. And also let us know um, how many people were joining online. Yes, we had, I think, about 80 people joining us online today. So and there was a robust um, online discussion as well that we will be posting to the event page. So if people would like to take a look at the things that were talked about in other programs, um, please do check back in. Um, we have a question from Stephen Walsh, who is curious about um, the effort to, to impart quality on the seed sector. Is there, has there been more of a focus of embedding capacity to assess quality at the, the seed merchant and producer level, or has, it, has quality been left more to an inspection system and regulatory environment? Interesting. Where where is the quality being verified and assessed? Um, and actually, I'll just jump in really quickly to let everyone here and online know that we have a AgriLinks webinar next Tuesday on e-verification of agricultural inputs um, that includes seeds as well as fertilizer. So that also might contribute to this discussion. Um, a webinar only event next Tuesday. Um, maybe the online people would have that sort of seed merchant perspective. Uh, Victor or uh, the Catalyst team, do you want to jump in on that? Um, I'm going to have a time lag between um, hearing the question. Um, it's hard, hard to hear the question. It was mostly about verifying the quality of seed, where that occurs along the value chain. Does it occur? Yeah, at the, at the regulation office. Uh, okay. okay. Um, if I can come in. Um, so the quality uh, normally is uh, in stuff um, right from um, the production. So I mean, in the case of Tanzania, for example, uh, the seed inspectors will initially uh, they need to get information about the plots where the seeds will be grown, and then of course uh, they need to also have already got the seeds to be planted or, or certified. So that is already checked, and uh, once it's planted in the course of uh, what is the seed multiplication plot, 
um, they would uh, arrange to come in at some point um, in the production cycle, I think twice, um, at a growth stage and also just before harvest. And then once it is harvested, they also take it to the lab you know, to do some testing. And then once it goes, uh, it's up, uh, it goes through that testing procedure and it's approved, um, then we can certify that. So, and I think this varies from country to country. You know. But um, it, it, normally the, the inspectors come in at the middle of the production and also you know, after the seeds have been processed. Yeah. benefit, uh, it, but I, I, I do think addressing value is extremely relevant and important. Thanks for all this. Great. I, we are coming up on time, and I always like to end our seminars right on time. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to say wonderful thank you to Carl, to Victor, and to uh, our team from Catalyst for presenting today. And most importantly, thank you to everyone who joined us in person and online. And um, keep an eye out for future emails about future events. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.